I'm uh, I'm Mathis, uh, Mathis Chereau. I'm um, I don't know if a long time organizer, but I've been around in the anti-war movement for about half a decade. Um, I'm a veteran myself of the U.S. Army, uh, an Iraq war resistor. We wanted somebody uh, who was given orders. I was a sergeant uh, in the Infantry Ready Reserve when I was given orders to deploy to, deploy to Iraq, um, and I refused them. I refused those orders on sort of uh, uh, moral um, grounds. Uh, I guess this was in 2008, and uh, I, was, I announced that I was uh, not going to obey my orders in Congress, actually, in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, from there, fought sort of a year long battle against the military over what I felt was my right to refuse to participate in fights and only wrong. A, a war that I thought was immoral and racist and you know, genocidal, but also illegal. Um, and so that's kind of how I came into the movement. And I came into the movement through uh, an organization, actually, which I'm, I'm uh, on, on the uh, brochure. I'm actually cited as still being a part of um, IBAW. And uh, while I was very active with them for a number of years, I'm actually no longer uh, with IBAW, and one of the reasons that uh, you know I, I decided that I needed to sort of move forward from organizing exclusively with the veterans movement is I ran into I started running into a lot of issues um, around um, supporting the troops. Um, I began to take a sort of a, a moral issue, like I said, not only with the wars but also with this whole concept of supporting the troops in the U.S. and how this was used and, and still is being used to um, reinforce support, not just for our current wars, but our broader system of you know, militarism and, and global domination. Um, and so, as I don't think I really have to tell anybody in this room, to go around in the United States, especially within a veterans movement, and talk about the need to move beyond this supporting the troops paradigm um, is not necessarily a, a popular thing. It's not really a populist agenda item. Um, but to me, and to I think more and more people as, as time goes on, it, it, it's becoming more and more um, prevalent. And it's becoming more and more clear to us that, um, that we have to start addressing deeper um, the nature of our military, the nature of the crimes that members of our military commit, not just against people in countries that we occupy, but also against each other. Um, that we need to start examining these issues deeper, um, understanding them on a systematic level. Um, and in doing this, um, you know, having to uh, intellectually tie oneself to only looking into these crimes to the extent that it doesn't go against this concept of supporting the troops, that that, that creates a, a barrier, in fact, and, and, and a, a hurdle too great for um, a movement, in many cases, to get over. And so, um, you know, in, in speaking about the, um, the military and, and sort of what the military does, um, First of all, it's important to define what the U.S. military is, um, because it's one of those things that um, tends to get a pass in society very often. People um, have seen, come to see the military as almost a brand, like uh, any other kind of brand, and this is, you know, the result of a lot of different forces at work in society. Um, you know, certainly in military recruiting um, works very hard to present an image of the military, not just to people that's trying to recruit in the military, but to the broader public in, in general. Um, and I think uh, everybody here has probably been exposed to at least what the military believes, or wants you, you to believe uh, what the military is all about um, in some commercial, some billboard, anybody? Schools, yeah, ROTC. I mean, even their slogans, like, really tend to get out of the population. I mean, just right off the top of your head, can anybody 
think of like a military recruiting slogan that they've heard? Army strong. Army strong. There you go. Then that's sort of the, the newest and the latest and uh, uh, really um, from our from my position anyway the most frightening um, recruiting campaign of recent history. But you know they go they go back. Uh, Army strong is just the new kid on the block. Before Army strong there was. Um, Army of One, um, which is even kind of where we took the, the title of this debate from, uh, or this, excuse me, this panel, uh, an Army of Rape. Um, it's sort of a redefinition of that, that slogan. Um, and uh, so there was that. Before that, there was, uh, what was it? There was, um, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, Be All You Can Be, right? Um, what do all these images like generate for us? Um, you know, as far as what our military is all about, like what kind of ideas about our military do these slogans give you? And you can just like blur it out. That's what you're going to develop as a person. It's a friendly place. Um, what else? No, it's okay. Good morning, Sarah. Hey, how are you? Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm glad we were just talking about it. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, this is the only walking into the chair. No, no, no. Yes. I just kind of launched into a, a talking about Army Strong um, and Army Strong. Okay. I can stop there. Do you want to introduce yourself uh, real quick? I was going to introduce you. Uh, <laughs> I'm Sansara Taylor, I write for Revolution newspaper, and I'm moderating this session. <laughs> yeah. And um, actually, the other thing, I don't know, probably... I know. Okay. So, <laughs> you're aware of that. Uh, so, you should, I was going to let you... Pardon me? Oh, Carl Dix was the other panelist. He is um, a veteran of the Vietnam War, and he did two years in, mili in Leavenworth Military Prison for refusing to serve in that war. He's a supporter actually a member of the Revolutionary Communist Party, and he is actually not late. He's unable to be here. So um, I said his, I bring his regards, and he was very happy that this panel is taking place, but he's not able to be here. So what I had thought we would do, except that I was so late, is that, um, I appreciate you guys' humor about that, um, is that I thought you should speak, and I, and I thought maybe I could do some interviewing and conversation with you about the theme, and then we'd oh. open it up which I assume is probably similar to what you were proceeding with. So why don't you proceed? Sort of, indeed, yeah. indeed. So um, that actually reminds me, actually, I'm glad that Son Sarah mentioned. Um, one of the things that, that I was so very excited about today, and, you know, I'm a little, I guess, disappointed, but I do hope Carl feels better. I mean, I know he's sick, and uh, it's, it sucks to be sick, and so I hope he feels better. But Carl was actually one of my, like, you know, as a source of personal inspiration for me. Um, and in a lot of ways, one of my heroes. Um, and because, as I mentioned earlier, I refused to deploy to Iraq. Well, you know, that was that that was what three or four decades after Carl had refused to deploy to Vietnam, and Carl did time in jail for that decision. Um, and you know, it's just uh, you know, it was such a huge part of actually modern American history and the history of resistance in America that's in many ways been withheld from young people in this country and uh, and so anytime I get a chance to speak with Carl I always feel very honored um, because you know I mean I was I was a little luckier I I refused to deploy to Iraq I managed to sort of get away with it in essence you know I didn't do jail time Carl you know he spent two years um, behind bars for his decision and you know beyond simply that he spent the, the remainder of his life dedicated locked in constant struggle uh, with this system and it's just uh, is a fantastic uh, you know brilliant voice of resistance um, he wasn't even taken in by the whole Obama thing I remember even when I was still like tooting Obama's horn a car was already in front of that one and uh, and so, you know, the, the panel is definitely less for Carl not being able to be here today. Um, but he's somebody that everybody should look up because he's a very remarkable uh, individual. Carl thinks, you know, it's right there on your, on your thing, but there's just lots and loads. I mean, yeah, talk about a lifetime spent dedicated to struggling, you know. I mean, like I said, I'm lucky to be here with like half a decade spent, you know, 
in the movement, half of which, you know, was, was behind this whole support the troops paradigm, thinking that we could use this whole support the troops paradigm to sort of um, bring the military into our popular struggle against George Bush and against the Iraq war. Um, and so, um, yeah, we'll kind of get, I guess, back to, to the panel with that. Um, so we were, we were talking about recruiting campaigns and the images they generate of service for people. Um, more and more I've come to find that a lot of these um, ideas can be summed up in like one or two words often that reflect some type of cultural idea um, that, that is so sort of seemingly broad that, that, uh, that it makes for you know, a very good <coughs> basis you know, around which to build this idea of the military. So, for example, the word heroism. You know, when I surveyed recently 163 high school students in Lower Manhattan, the, just simply the word heroism was something that they they significantly identified as being as having something to do with the military. Um, honor, it's another kind of one-word summation of of. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's sort of even how they break it down as far as the, the uh, recruiting campaigns go, right? I mean, uh, you know, especially having been in the military, they, you know, they, they tend to uh, operate like everybody's kind of stupid. <laughs> and they tend to try and break things down for to like one or two words. Uh, and so, you know, you get, you get, that's, you get these values, these one, or, these one word values like distilled down and they work so very hard to proliferate you know, ideas rooted in these values. Um, duty uh, is another one. Loyalty. Um, you know, he said heroism, but like courage, right? Uh, uh, something else very interesting, I mentioned I surveyed all these high school students. Another uh, term that they found to be very much related to military service was masculinity. Um, and even, uh, this is especially prevalent among the male survey, the population of male surveys. They seem to believe that the military is somehow very related to being a man. Um, but uh, you know, what are some other ideas? Empowerment. You know, part of this, part of the, the new uh, generation of like uh, military recruiting campaigns was built around this idea of not so much you know the military is about what can you know you do for your country but more about like what can the army do for you, right? And so they built from this, you know, shifting paradigm, this uh, army of one campaign out of which, you know, grew this, the, the, the whole party line that, you know, oh, the military has got, you know, a hundred and some odd different jobs and career fields that you can choose from. And we offer career training in all of these different areas and we offer money for college and benefits and so on and so forth and it's all about and furthermore, you know, with keeping with the whole idea of army of one, you know, they're 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 talking about the army will not just give you these things, but the army will make people identify you in these ways. And what ways are those? You know, heroic, courageous, loyal, right? All of these all of these values that people seem to come to, to associate with military, masculine, um, you know. Um, and so, you know, it operates like a brand, but behind that brand um, is, is something that doesn't at all look like the recruiting material. Um, the military is, believe it or not, a very oppressive environment. Um, it's not fun. Um, it's, it's not uh, honorable. Um, people in the military typically don't show much loyalty to each other. Even as far as masculinity goes, I think that that um, the military for me was one of the most emasculating experiences of my entire life. Um, you know, it's uh, it, the actual experience of being in uniform, of being in the ranks, runs so contradictory to that image generated in society by these recruiting campaigns, which, like I said, you know, don't just generate commercials anymore. Um, they, they try to strike very deep at the, at the heart of American culture and try and make military service, service synonymous with these different ideas. Um, 
our panel today was specifically looking at issues of uh, concerning sex in the military and rape in the military and sexual assault, um, which is a huge problem in the military. Um, and is even one of those problems that the, that the military doesn't even get away with denying um, its existence of anymore. Um, it's one of those um, sort of dirty secrets, and I've heard it referred to, rape in the military as being a dirty secret that's becoming more and more difficult um, for the military to keep secret. And in fact, they can't keep it secret anymore. Um, they can't hide the statistics, which show every year you know, a, a steady rise in the number of people who become victims of military sexual trauma, which, uh, you know, interestingly enough, it is sort of considered in its own diagnosis um, in the field of psychology. I mean, rape and sexual assault is so prevalent in the military that there is a, there is a category unto itself when it comes to trying to, you know, break apart, um, you know, uh, mental disorders and things like that, uh, the trauma. Um, so I, I, I want to say it was uh, recently I, I, I read, um, you know, a couple of years ago that the, the um, thing that people were talking about constantly was that I believe it was every uh, 28 minutes a soldier killed themselves. Or it might have been every 21 minutes a soldier or a veteran um, somewhere in the world kills themselves. Um, you know, the most recent thing I've, I've read is, is um, this whole idea of now um, soldiers um, in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan being more likely to be raped by and sexually assaulted by fellow service members than to actually be, um, you know, injured or killed by the enemy. Um, you know, it's something that's become, like I said, such a problem that even you know, as recent as the last couple of months, um, you know, defense officials, officials within the Defense Department, you know, have even been trying to initiate policy changes um, to, to, you know, at least in theory protect um, potential victims and, um, you know, furthermore bring about um, a higher level of reporting of rape and sexual assault in the military. Um, I just, I wrote down a couple of numbers uh, this morning. Um, it was estimated last year um, that while there were 3,158 reported uh, cases of sexual assault that occurred within the military, um, it's estimated there was nearly another 20,000 that didn't get reported. Um, some agencies, some government agencies, you know, suggest that as, as few as 10% of sexual assaults in the military and rapes in the military get reported through the proper chains. Um, beyond that, what's, what's incredibly disturbing is that uh, out of those cases that were reported, um, that men and women did come forward and um, did initiate some type of uh, legal process against, um, against uh, you know, an assaulter, um, only, there was only 104 actual convictions out of 3,158 reported incidences, there was just, literally just over 100 convictions. You know, and this is in a system um, that, you know, boasts uh, the uh, court-martial process, uh, the court-martial proceedings as its main source of like, you know, it's like a military court of law, right? Um, and, and court marshals typically have a 95% conviction rate, right? Um, think about that. 95% of cases brought before court marshals result in the conviction of whoever is being court martialed. So even given that statistic of the of the more than 3,000 reported cases of sexual assault occurring, um, you know we have only 104 convictions. So it speaks to a problem. It speaks, it, uh, you know, clearly it speaks to a problem. Um, you know, one, it speaks to a problem in that there's, you know, a, a problem with under-reporting. You know, they said only 10% of these cases make it forward anyway. But then on top of that, of those that do, such a tiny percent actually result 
any type of uh, you know justice or substantiation um, for the victim, that it actually serves to reinforce um, the idea that was definitely very prevalent when I was in the military, um, that reporting sexual assault actually just did more harm than good. That the best thing to do was just sort of, um, you know, suck this kind of stuff up as being a natural part of, uh, of you know, military experience and drive forward, get out, and move on with the rest of your life. Um, and so much trauma and so much, um, 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 so many very, very bad um, experiences in the military um, that aren't, don't just relate to sex, but relate to all, you know, facets of the human experience, uh, are, are also dismissed in the same, um, you know, it's only a couple of years, someday I'll get out of the military and move on kind of manner, but, um, you know, so part of this panel, part of our work is, you know, reinforcing uh, or is at least making the argument that, uh, especially within veterans communities, especially among those veterans who have come away with experiences of the military that are, look so very different than that military which everybody feels the need to support without question. Um, you know, we make the argument that, look, actually doing things like that it, it sort of does help reinforce the status quo. Um, and does help fuel misperceptions among the general population of what's actually going on in the military. So I don't want to actually even just get too hung up on, on what soldiers are doing to each other. Um, because while it is such a huge part of what goes on, and rape and sexual assault within the ranks is such a huge part of what occurs in the military, um, there is also an incredible issue in the military of, um, of rape and sexual assault against whatever population, local population we happen to be occupying, right? And this isn't simply tied to um, war zones. This can be any uh, country out there. And something we have to remember about the U.S. being an empire and the military participating in, in the maintenance of that empire is their military bases, I believe, in more than 150 countries in the world. Now, my experience in the military is very unique um, in that I spent the vast majority of, majority of it overseas. Um, I spent two years in Japan and two years in Germany. Um, and I spent time in a lot of other places, the Afghanistan, the Philippines, uh, Poland, uh, you know, uh, Italy, I, I mean, uh, and a variety of other countries, um, all, you know, with the commonality that they all had U.S. military bases with U.S. military personnel. That, um, you know, it was my job in the military, I was an Army journalist, to, uh, you know, tell the, the story of the soldiers, but to do so in a very controlled way, in a way that would agree with, with you know, U.S. Uh, military strategic initiatives initiatives and things like that. Um, and, and so in spending nearly four and a half years at these overseas locations, I got a um, real um, first-hand, real close um, to the fire sort of um, education in the sexual politics of military service, especially at these overseas locations. Um, I don't want to make this panel too much about, um, you know, just sharing personal narratives and things like that. But I will share at least one or two because I think they uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, contribute to, to the discussion. Um, and, uh, and really actually il illustrate for me anyway the, uh, you know, it tells a, it, it, it tells a large part of my story in the military and sort of the own, my own uh, trauma and uh, my struggle that I, that I face as a result of my service in the military. But um, I'll just tell the story. Um, so it was, it was, I graduated uh, journalism school in, uh, in um, 2000 and, oh, I believe, three. And I went to airborne school. Right after I went to airborne school, I was given orders to... Um, to the uh, to go to Japan. I was uh, ordered. Uh, my orders were to Japan, 
um, to U.S. Army Japan, uh, which was two-star command, and I was uh, I was going to go work at a paper, right? And so they sent me initially to Okinawa. Now, U.S. Army Japan is is headquartered out of Tokyo, but there's like a smaller command in Okinawa, um, which is a tropical island that's you know considered part of Japan. That's about four-hour plane ride south of uh, Tokyo, and they initially sent me here because uh, they thought they wanted me to report on this, uh, um, I think, specific Special Forces unit that was in Okinawa. Um, and so I went there initially, and um, actually, uh, when I got to this company and then I went to this, to this unit or whatever, um, they said, uh, uh, we're a Special Forces unit, why on earth would we want an Army journalist writing stories about us? <laughs> we don't need a journalist writing stories about us. You can't write stories about this stuff. So uh, eventually, uh, I was actually sent all the way up to Tokyo, and I spent the majority of my time in Japan and Tokyo, but for the first two weeks, I was in Okinawa. And my first night in Okinawa, literally my first night outside of the country, off, uh, you know, outside of, uh, you know, U.S. soil, um, I get to my unit there, and, and um, I meet, uh, I guess, what would have been my squad had I stayed in Okinawa. Like I said, I didn't. Um, and it was a, it was a headquarters company, and um, you know they said, oh, you know, it's nice to you know, you know meet you. You're you know, Sharon specialist, whoever. You know, you'll meet Sergeant whoever here in a little bit. We'll take care of you. We'll you know make sure uh, you know you get squared away. You know, we'll introduce you to people, you know, help bring you into kind of our little community here, right? Which I felt was kind of rather encouraging. Uh, and, uh, you know, so eventually uh, the sergeant came by and they said, this is Sergeant Whoever. And, um, and Ludovic said, I don't even remember the guy's name because I was there only for so short of a time. And they said, you know, this is uh, Chereau. He's going to be in the company, but he's going to be, you know, doing stories about this unit. Um, we're thinking about taking him out and showing him a good time. And the sergeant said, well, actually, he's like, you've never been outside of the country before, right? And I said, no, I've never been outside of the country. He said, no, well, we really, you know, you know what we should do? He said, we should break him in. And I, and I kind of, you know, I wasn't really sure what that meant. Um, but he said, we should break him in. And, like, kind of gave everybody, like, the eyes, and everybody kind of went, like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, we should break him in. And, you know, I, I, me, I'm thinking that, you know, as coming out of a military training environment, that this likely means hazing. Usually in the military, when you get to a new unit, you're sort of initiated into that unit through some type of hazing ritual. Um, and uh, so I figured it just sort of meant like, oh, I'm going to have to, you know, just do push-ups all night or, you know, run around carrying rucksacks or just something stupid, something hazing. And they said, no, no, we're going to, they said, yeah, we should break them in. Let's say we got to take them to the banana show. Um, and uh, uh, I didn't really know what to expect. I was, uh, you know, I'm, I am from Alabama. Uh, I was raised um, relatively conservative. Um, you know, there certainly wasn't uh, much of a... Uh, sex trade around Auburn, Alabama that I was exposed to anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, I was taken to the banana show. And what the banana show was, uh, was a, I would call her retirement age, um, woman, a uh, Japanese woman, um, whose show consisted of, um, first of all, stripping, um, and then picking up quarters uh, with her vagina, um, and then distributing to the audience exact change. Um, this audience, by the way, this, this location is like right off of Kadena, Air, it's probably still there, I don't even, I don't know, but was, is right off of Kadena Air Base. Um, it's almost entirely uh, frequented by uh, U.S. military personnel. Uh, nearly everybody there was uh, either a soldier, mostly Marines. Okinawa is mostly Marine Force, I said, but there's also a lot of air military next to the air base. Um, but anyway, um, this lady, it was, you know, um, her show to go around and distribute this uh, exact change to people. And then after that, um, she would um, 
insert peeled bananas into her vagina um, and then shoot them at the audience. Um, or specifically, um, often what times, what would be the case, and like I said, I don't even know this one time, but um, you know, I definitely, there was a lot of people who were doing quite a bit. And the whole shtick is, uh, um, you know, they'll take the new guy, um, and uh, they tried to do this to me, and I just wasn't having it. They couldn't make it okay with me. Um, uh, they take the new guy, and they, uh, you know, put him on stage, and this uh, this woman squats over his face and drops a piece of the banana into his mouth, or her, I guess, um, and. Uh, so anyway, they, that's what they wanted me to do, and I just simply was not <laughs> going to. Um, and uh, but no, they 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 she still they did still make her come over and um, shoot bananas at me. As uh, you know, I don't I wouldn't say I was necessarily restrained, um, but uh, you know, I definitely knew I could get up and leave. Um, or that if I, if I had done that, it would have seriously um, damaged my ability to be in this unit. Um, and um, oftentimes this show would also involve like uh, forced oral sex, I've heard. I didn't myself witness it, but um, I heard that, uh, you know, oftentimes also uh, what would happen is they would get a new guy on stage and shoot said would drop these pieces of banana in his mouth while also performing oral sex on it at the same time. Um, pretty much, I mean, you can imagine the types of things that the people in the audience were screaming at uh, this woman, um, calling her a slut and a skank. And, you know, um, it seemed to be the biggest joke that, um, that uh, you know, a lot of the soldiers really like to point out the fact that they, they thought this woman performing these acts for their pleasure was uh, in no way attractive, so they would just you know, harp on, you know, like what an old ugly bitch she was or whatever. And uh, um, really, I, 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 I kind of view it as, um, as sort of turning a person into a toilet in a way. Um, and, uh, yeah. And you know that's it, oddly enough, actually, that's an experience that didn't even come back to me until well after I started talking about issues of <laughs> rape, sexual assault, and and just uh, this type of garbage going on in the military. Um, this was a memory that came back to me, like I said, just quite a bit after um, I uh, was was already talking about these issues. Um, so, like I said, I don't want to get too hung up in, in uh, you know, like I said, personal uh, narratives and things like that, because I'll spend the next week paying for it. <laughs> and I'll already, I'm sure, be paying for the stuff that I've just said. But, um, you know, I mean, it's part of uh, challenging this narrative of the military being something worthwhile supporting, right? Um, if they put this on the recruiting poster, they'd have a little harder time, you know, talking about blessing the troops in church on Sunday, right? <laughs> like, they might have a little harder time, you know, selling it to the Boy Scouts, you know, if this is the kind of thing that we got out. This is such a small piece of, of the culture, and, I, and it's important to, to call it what it is. It's military culture. This wasn't just, it's not just a few soldiers acting bad. It's not just a few, you know, units that need better leadership. It's military culture. Um, and uh, um, I'm just going to pause to collect my bearings and maybe let some Sarah talk a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, the first thing I want to say is I think that's, it's, it's it's true, it's part of the culture, and it is actually, it's a, part of the reason we did this panel, this panel emerged from, um, I've been, I don't want to tell the whole backstory, but part of it is we wanted to do panels that brought together the question of the liberation of women. Um, and from my own perspective, how essential the full liberation of women is to the emancipation of humanity in any revolution worth making. 
that you can't liberate women without making a revolution, and you can't make any revolution worth making without taking the liberation of women as a driving force. Um, and the more thoroughly that I'm a supporter of the Revolutionary Communist Party, the more thoroughly I have gotten into this and taken up this struggle, the more that actually in a different way, but in some similar ways, my own experience in, in, in fighting against the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and spending time with veterans and, and learning about what happened there um, has brought back to me and recalled to me quite a bit of, actually brought more into focus how much the, the, the culture in the military and of what the military fights for includes the enslavement and degradation of women. And as I was, you know, and then as I've been doing further research, there's a few things that I'd like to bring in, too, about this institutionalized role of the military in the trafficking of women, in the use of women in brothels around the world, and in the violence against women within the military. But as I was doing all this, it came back to me, um, which actually had been with me, but it stood out in even starker relief, that it is all too rare and actually absolutely essential, the kind of truth-telling and bringing to bear of Yes, it's personal narrative, but it is what you described. It concentrates something larger. It's not a personal narrative that that you know one person who had a great experience in the military and they're going to tell you about it. It's a personal narrative that contradicts the essence of what the military is. It's a personal narrative which is actually true and concentrates something much larger and about the essence of the military. And here I wanted to to you know bring one other example in and make a larger point from it, which is. The other thing, as you were talking, that just came back to me, um, which was the the chain of command. I was people remember the the um, Abu Ghraib, the pictures of torture that came out of um, Iraq, the detainees that by U.S. military, and they they were all sexualized. You know, they were they were detainees stripped naked and stacked in pyramids. They were forced to perform sex acts on each other under threat of violence. There was an immense brutality and torture, but a lot of it was sexualized as well. And I want to talk about the overlap, and I actually want to ask you some in a minute to, to reflect on the overlap between the war culture and, and pornography culture, and that both of them are enslavement and degradation. And, and, and there, I have some thoughts in the interrelation, but one of the things that... Um, Larry Everson is here, and he might remember this too, but we did a, we worked together, um, him more than myself, uh, on a Bush Crimes Commission during the Bush years, and one of the things that we did is we had testimony from a woman, Janice Karpinski, who was one of the people who exposed the Abu Ghraib scandal. And one of the things that never, ever, I never heard anywhere but from her in that testimony, was that and it makes sense in a certain sense what was the news internationally was what was done to the detainees and the torture. And then it was codified and, and commanded all the way up to Rumsfeld. He knew exactly what was happening and she exposed that, that this was this was not a few bad soldiers. This was a doctrine of the military. Um, but one of the things that she said is that in that same period there was a there was a spate of deaths of soldiers. And they were actually deaths of female soldiers by dehydration. And at first this seemed like, okay, well you're in the rock, it's very hot. And people are getting dehydrated and they're dying of dehydration. But she specified how when this came up in the, um, when she reported this to her commanders and she explained why it was happening, they said, we have to remove from the books that it was female soldiers who were dying of dehydration. Just mark it as soldiers dying of dehydration. And it looks like what happened in Iraq overall. But what actually had happened is there was such a culture of, of sexual assault and violence against women among the, against the population being conquered and massacred, but also within the military, that women in the military were terrified to go to the bathroom at night. Because to get to the bathroom, they had to leave their barracks and go past the men's barracks to get to the bathrooms. And it was so palpable and so absolutely expected that they would be sexually assaulted and raped that they would stop drinking fluids at about 3 or 4 in the afternoon so that they wouldn't have to urinate in the middle of the night. And this was a mass phenomenon such that there was a whole series of women dying of dehydration because they didn't want to have to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night because they would be sexually assaulted by the men in the next barracks. 
And then when this got known about, what the official response was, was to erase the fact that there were females dying. And I just think that's one small sample. I mean, it's, it's another one of those things that, it's like, it, it's, it's, it's different than having lived it and having it come back. It's a world of heart, but it's actually, there's a lot of things that come out like this that, that actually reveal something very essential. And it's one of those things I had forgotten until I'm sitting here listening to you talk. Um, the, the, the larger point I want to make from this, and then I want to, if you are ready, I'll ask you a couple more questions, and you know, before long we'll open it up. But I, I want to say that actually a military is a concentration of the kind of world they're fighting to extend and enforce. And it's a really important thing. If you have a, a military that is serving an empire, an imperialist empire, that actually has patriarchy and male supremacy woven into its very foundation and fabric, which all class societies do, and imperialist capitalism certainly does. If that's what the society is that you're fighting to protect, to expand, and defend, then those relations are going to get reflected in your military and concentrated. So if you, you know, live in a world of rape, a world of domination and subjugation of women by men, if that's essential to your system, then that's going to be concentrated even more in the military that fights and uses violence to enforce that system. Um, organized, systematic use of violence to enforce that is going to include that. And all oppressive and, and patriarchal systems have had militaries that concentrate violence against women. Um, it's, it's actually not essential that um, if you're if in a revolutionary si situation, in a revolutionary force, would actually have to have, if it was really fighting for liberatory, a, a different world that has a liberation of humanity and of women as an essential foundation, then it could have actually a military whose culture reflects something different and is fighting with means that are consistent with the ends that it's trying to bring to being. I think that's an important thing to, to, to bring in. But there's a reason, and I think it's, it's, there's a reason that this stuff is concentrated in the military, and it, and it, and it reflects something larger about the system that it's fighting for. Um, so the actual, then I have sort of a reflection and a, and a question, which maybe you want to bounce off of and see where you want to go with. But, but I do want to, um, I do want to talk about the, The sexualizing of violence, um, which happens in American culture overall, um, and the and the you know the, what porn, after this panel in this room we're doing a panel on pornography and, and the sex industry and whether it should be uprooted and abolished or whether it can be regulated and reclaimed and I'll argue that it should be uprooted and abolished and it'll be a debate I hope some of you sit down. Um, but one of the distinctions I make is that pornography is the sexualized enslavement and degradation of women. It's not just sex. It is actually sex is sex. Erotic comes from the word eros. It's passionate love, passionate desire, sexual desire. That's one thing. Porn actually comes from the Greek word, Greek root pornographos, which is about female sex slaves and concubines. It's it's conquered sex, it's colonized sex, it's I own you sex. And so that's actually the way that, that either there's total puritanism and repression in the society or there's domination and degradation that's sexualized. And those, that's, the, that's what's mainstreamed in this, in this culture. And then when you get in the military, there's, there is both a, a concentration of use and, 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 and use of pornography and the sex industry, but then also an overlap with that and the way that violence and killing is sexualized. And I, I could think of some examples, but I, I would rather have, if you have reflections on that or insights yeah. on that, yeah. Yeah, certainly. Well, I think before I forget, first of all, I think it's very interesting you brought up this example of uh, Janice Karpinski. Um, she was a, a one-star general, I believe, in charge of Maybe not specifically Abu Ghraib, but I think maybe his man that was in charge of a couple of different prisons. But one way or the other, she was in the chain of command for Abu Ghraib, and she did. Um, she is a whistleblower. She blew the whistle. Um, and Janice Karpinski was actually scapegoated in such a huge way 
for blowing the uh, whistle. In many ways, the military tried to um, make the whole Abu Ghraib scandal out to be Janice's fault, um, specifically. Um, and so it actually, to me, sort of connects to the idea also of women trying to report rape and sexual assault as victims in the military becoming further victimized by a system that they're just trying to seek justice through. Um, so I just, you know, as soon yeah. as you mentioned Janice's name, I just went, wow, I, that's a, that is an example of a one-star general, uh, you know, a, a one-star general woman, um, you know, becoming, you know, in a way, like, you know, a victim of the system that she's using to try and, you know, at least enforce some type of, I mean, you know, it's impossible to ever, to even perceive of a just Abu Ghraib, right? But, you know, here's a situation where she is, trying to rectify what is a war crime, and she's scapegoated for it. Um, and so, you know, likewise, uh, women in the military are scapegoated oftentimes for trying to report, uh, you know, these incidences. Um, but you've talked about um, the uh, sexualization of violence in the military, and this is something of particular interest to me. And again, it's just another reason why I feel like supporting the troops is just a moral wrong. Um, is uh, that it, see, it's seemingly to such a, uh, you know, at the core of, of, of the U.S. military seems to be this lurid fascination with violence, um, with war, um, and with, as you said, sexualizing that. And maybe not even so much overtly sexualizing it, but, um, you know, it's been argued that you know that the act of rape is 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 about power, right? And is about uh, it can be about maybe it's been argued that it's about a, you know a man wanting to express his power over a woman, um, in this or, or or whoever in this complete uh, you know and total way. Well, in the same way, right? The military utilizes violence um, to uh, you know. Um, Express its power over whatever you know group it, it happens to be occupying, and and this whole group that's occupying thing is key because this whole these whole military occupations are kind of uh, they're, they're not a new animal, but um, you know it's not it's 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 not the same as uh, you know a lot of other wars in the past, right? Um, so one of the phenomenons in the military that I've wrote, written extensively on is uh, is this thing that. It's called war porn. Well, I don't know if you've seen any of that, um, but there exists this phenomena in the military, um, and we've even seen examples of it, you know, make its way to the public eye. Um, even as recently as the Marines, um, who were, you know, seen in that video urinating on the dead Taliban corpse corpses. Uh, this is an example of something that the mil in the military community, um, the military community community recognizes this stuff as being what's called war porn. Um, and war porn consists of like images, either video or still images of, you know, violence, death, war, um, um, or really any type of like depravity you could imagine that would typically be considered criminal if it occurred on U.S. soil. But because these acts occur in so-called war zones, um, they're not criminal and subject to um, becoming pornography. Um, and it is key, this whole uh, issue of, of creating pornography out of, out, of this, uh, out of the domination of these cultures, is, is something else that I've, I've, I've written on. Um, you know, we were talking about Abu Ghraib. You know, the significance of these um, images is not simply, you know, the the sort of, you know, disgusting, you know, inhumane situations that they represent. Um, what's interesting, and a lot of different academics have talked about this, is that they um, constitute these these specific images constitute narratives in U.S. domination, right? Um, and so, not only do they have the power to put, you know, people in the situations like what you saw in the Opera Grade videos, like what you saw with the Marines urinating on the dead corpses, you know, like what we've seen in a lot of other, you know, war porn that's made it to the surface. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, 
um, you know, it's, anyway, it's, it, needless to say, it's, it's, very, it's, it's very widespread, and it's something um, that uh, is, is very shocking, the way in which, um, you know, the power over these cultures is expressed, like I said, not just in the oppression, but then in the turning of that oppression into this pornographic uh, material. Um, I tell you, even just talking about this stuff is like very difficult for me, and it makes me uh, feel even less. Um, you know, I never, I don't really ever feel proud of having been in the military, but um, you know, uh, just the idea of, of, of being able to talk in such a desensitized way about like images of people being killed in combat and war and things like that is so commonplace. Um, like I said, again, is another part of, of you know, to me, building um, the image, of, the actual image of the military, which is not something, like I said, worth supporting. Um, you really got me out for a difficult topic. Boy, you don't ever ask me to come talk about easy stuff to you. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, it's, it's so important. And I, I want to, if we can, I'm not even sure what time it is, um, I do want to talk specifically about the importance of changing the language around supporting the truth, because that's, that's a huge part of what this panel is about, yeah. not just eliminating to people how corrupt the military is. I'm guessing there's not too many people in this room who need any more examples of atrocities to decide that the U.S. military is not a good thing. Um, what does what does seem to be a topic of some debate in the movement on the left is well what should our relationship as a movement be to the military and the party line so to speak up until this point has definitely been the movement cannot be perceived as being anti-military anti-troops anti-soldier whatever you want to call it um, the United States, or at least the American public, it seems, has this image of uh, protesters spitting on returning veterans of Vietnam or whatever, ingrained in their heads so deeply, with some question, even at whether or not it ever even happened to begin with, or whether or not, or even if soldiers deployed to Vietnam anywhere close to San Francisco, <laughs> I think there's some people who who've presented pretty compelling accounts that suggest that the places where they said these instances occurred sold before you even were near. But anyway, one way or the other, the reality is the American public believes that the, the, the movements of the 60s and 70s were anti-military, anti-soldier, anti-veteran, so on and so forth. And from this image has been derived this sort of totalitarian fear of criticizing too hard being just a little too critical in, in our pursuit of, you know, an honest narrative concerning the military. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, as, as we talked about earlier, that has presented a serious barrier. Definitely presented a serious barrier in the veterans movement. As I said, I've worked with, within the veterans movement for many, many years. And it is something that causes so much collective pain and I really mean that pain, this idea of support the troops is painful for soldiers and veterans, especially those struggling to, with issues, you know, that stem from things they don't feel proud about, that they, you know, don't really uh, feel heroic for. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, the issue is the language never seems to really get affected. The support the troops language never really seems to get affected by the facts on the ground, right? Um, for example, um, you know, if you go around in this country and you say things like, you shouldn't support the U.S. military because the U.S. military kills children in Afghanistan, um, you're likely to get a lot of, uh, you know, a fair amount of, of negative blowback from something like that. And people would think, um, you know, if they think of, of hearing somebody say the military kills children as somebody talking crap about the military. Oh, that person's just, you know, you know, trying to negatively paint the military or whatever. That person's, you know, um, you know, just trying to insult our service members or whatever, call them baby killers or whatnot. Um, but the thing is, you know, as we've seen as recently as last week, um, the military does kill children. 
And we see uh, examples of this constantly. The military does kill innocents. Um, the military does, uh, you know, uh, rape uh, indigenous populations, you know. The military does all of these different things, but if for some reason in, in the United States, it seems that if you point that out, if you call it what it is, um, then you are like shut off from the mainstream dialogue. Um, and so this is a hurdle uh, that, that has, I think, thrown uh, a huge stumbling block, not just in, 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 in terms of uh, trying to build a, an honest movement capable of, uh, a political movement capable of stopping wars that are in progress, um, but also in, in you know, the, the preemptive struggle to stop the next U.S. war from starting, which we know is uh, always just around the corner. Um, you know, so we constantly, and especially in the last 10 years, the war on, on terror years, we have seen more examples of, of, you know, this type of criminality, you know, occurring in the military, this type of these horrible things occurring at the hands of American soldiers. Um, but yet the language that we use when we talk about the military never seems to, to be affected by that. And it even seems to have taken root, like I said, on the left. Um, a lot of people, I feel like, on the left feel, and, and I can speak for myself especially, when I first started speaking out in the anti-war movement, each time I would make a you know statement that I felt seemed a little too critical of the military, I almost felt like I just was obliged to make one that, that sort of countered that. That said, you know, it's really, uh, you know, the war in Iraq is illegal and it's genocidal and it's racist and so on and so forth. But our men and women in uniform are just trying to do what's right and so on and so forth and blah, 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 blah. Or George Bush is a, is a, is a you know, a fascist and is, you know, destroying the rights of the American people and, and murdering people all over the planet based on personal racist vendettas. You know, but America is a really good country, you know, and we can really, you know, and so it always felt like you had to, to, to embrace this duality, right? And uh, at least concerning the military, I feel like a lot of that came back to not offending this support the troops, uh, you know, type topic uh, or type idea in, 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 uh, in the country. But the problem is, and as we've discovered, you know, of course, many, many times over, is that um, not all issues have two sides. Sometimes uh, issues are very one-sided, um, and sometimes it's okay um, to present issues as being one-sided. Um, and even on the left, that's okay. You know, we don't have to make conservative arguments to uh, we don't have to balance the truth claim with falsehood. Legitimacy. Exactly, but I feel like it's some it's a mistake that we made. It's certainly a mistake I made for years, um, and it's something that even. Um, completely countered, uh, you know, the good work that I was doing, trying to stop people from joining the military, trying to stop people from going off to war. Um, and so, uh, you know, part of part of what, you know, we need to do in this country to have a successful anti-war movement and to change this culture of militarization is we need to challenge the dominant p place that the military holds in society. We need to challenge it as being a thing of honor. We need to challenge it as being a thing of heroism and all of these other things. I mean, you know, even as early, like I said, as, as, as you know, when I was doing research for this panel, you know, I was reading a lot of, of people out there, you know, with a lot of serious critiques of rape in the military. Why is rape so prevalent in the military? You know, a lot of people have a lot of different things to say. You know, some Fox News uh, lady was saying, well, it's because, you know, um, of the proximity, and women should be expected to be raped in the military, you know. Um, oh, yeah, well, oh, yeah. well what, what's yeah. her name? I wrote her name down. Oh, Liz Trotta, a Fox News YouTuber. Yeah, she said, uh, she said, uh, what did she say? Yeah, that um, what do they expect, you know, because of the close contact. Uh, um, you know, other, other people, you know, were making very serious indictments of the military, uh, you know, saying that, you know, this this fact flies completely in the face of this image of the military we have of being a thing of honor and being a thing of heroism and being a, you know, a, a place where people go to build themselves up so they can, you know, charge into their future. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, um, yeah, I just, you know, it's important to challenge that, that dominant place because even this, even some of these people making these indicting, you know, claims about the military, almost every single circumstance, even in, in the most sort of 
critical article at the very end. It had it seemed because it felt like the author had made so many negative claims about the military that they had to say, you know, our military is something of honor, and we have a tradition of supporting the troops in this country. But if we want to be honest about that, then we have to, you know, fix this rape issue, as opposed to, you know, we need to change, you know, the reality. The language is fine. We just need to, like, you know, go in and change the reality. And, you know, I, I think that's, that's lunacy. I think unless we can start off by acknowledging, you know, by changing the language, you know, the reality is never going to reflect that. And, you know, and, and, uh, and I would say even, you know, uh, as far as my work as a counter-recruiter has gone, I go into high schools and to colleges talking to young people about why they should not join the military because, you know, it is not a good experience and it's not helpful for your future and things like that. Um, you know, one of the biggest reasons I find within young people wanting to join is not the economic reason. It's not that I want to go to college. It's not the, you know, I want the cash bonuses. It's that the military in America is something that people are proud of. And if I join the military and I'm fine finished with the military, that's going to make me special. And people are going to think I'm honorable and heroic and courageous and loyal and all those things we were talking about. You know, they think you know I want to join the military not because so much because I want to be a soldier, but because I want to be a veteran. Because God, this country loves veterans, right? Well, they think anyway. I mean, it's not really so much the case, but you know. But this is the reason that's given so often that I want to be the military because in the military because I will be honored. For that decision, and there just seems so few decisions one can make in America anymore that will be honored by people on both the left and the right. Yeah, I mean, if you're a young kid, you're looking at a world and it's just chaos and such, you know, fighting between like an apparently entrenched left and right. But one thing they can agree on is we love and support the troops. They're just like, well, hell, sign me up for that. You know, and they're like, I'll just do that. Everybody will love me, right? Um, and so, you know, imagine, you know, uh, if the reality was. And I don't, I don't think that it should be. And again, I don't think that uh, it, it maybe was in the past, like it's been said it was in the past. But I think if young people in this country looked at the uh, joining the military and coming home and thought, you know, maybe I wouldn't be honored as much as some people might honestly, you know, want to spit on me, it would probably be a lot less likely to join to begin with. And so I'll just, uh, you know, let's let's converse from there, but I, I mean, it, it is critical that we become, as a movement, far more critical, and as, as the left, we become far more critical of not just the military as an institution, um, but the type of individual acts that get carried out within it, and withdraw our support, um, because the longer we continue offering this, this blind support uh, to this institution, the more incentive we give young people to join it the more incentive we give it to not change. Why would we change anything? People already love and support us, right? Um, and the more we honestly dilute ourselves, dilute our messages, and become complicit with the actual crimes that are occurring. And, I, and, and that's something that, that should go for anybody out there who has ever considered walking around with the support the troops rhetoric, you know? Um, myself included, because I used to walk around with this rhetoric. When you walk around saying things like that, you are you are complicit in the crimes our troops can commit. It is a responsibility not to support uh, armies and um, you know any organizations that engage systematically in the kinds of acts that um, we systematically engage in. I mean, I think there would be less there would likely be less moral hazard walking around wearing a shirt that says "I support the mafia." All right? And so think about it. You got to think about it in those terms. All right, and we have to challenge this, this, this support the troops, no matter what paradigm, because it's crippling us. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll, I'll say a couple things, and then maybe we should throw it open and get some comments, questions. We can continue here too, but. Um, I want to go back to the question of, uh, well, let me, it's not going to be point one, point two, point three. I'm just going to say a few things. But earlier you said this is not an easy topic. Jeez. And I agree. Last week I was sitting, um, we did this protest. Uh, some of you have this flyer. It's a, 
and has a statement against to end pornography and patriarchy, the enslavement and degradation of women. And I was part of a protest where we started at St. Patrick's Cathedral. This is actually not unrelated. We started at St. Patrick's Cathedral because of the attacks on birth control and abortion. We protested there. We went to the U.S. military center and protested there because of the role of the military in, in, in enforcing violence against women around the world and in the military. And then we went to strip clubs and porn stores and we protested there. And a number of things happened. People spoke out, actually, and it was, it was a fight throughout the day, I'll just be honest, because exactly the story that he told about, he went with his, with his, uh, the whole group of guys, what is it, the, the, not a platoon, the, the group, whatever, the company, whatever it was. The group, it, it, an official group, an official group, you know, the, uh, the squad, thank you. The squad, the unit, thank you. I'm like, I don't think military. Um, uh, at least not U.S. military. Um, the, and you weren't physically restrained, but had you gotten up and, and said, I'm not part of this, there was a lot of force in that that you have to be part of this, from the culture, to the attitudes, to what, you know, to right down on the ground, are you going to be safe? I mean, all those things are real. The threat, actually, the physical violence against people who don't conform is, is a real thing. But even short of that, there's, there's a whole level of enforcement. And so for people to break out of that, from that level or in this society, where literally every day, if you want to call a 30-year-old woman a slut for using birth control, you can scream it at the top of your lungs, everybody will echo you, blah, blah, blah. If you want to speak up and say, I want birth control, it's fine to have sex without wanting to get pregnant, or it's, you know, or you want to tell your story of rape, or you want to, or you can just process that. Those stories are told in whispers. They're told in whispers and they're told through tears. How many women, everybody in this room, whether you know it or not, knows multiple women who've been sexually assaulted and raped. That doesn't get talked about. Also, you know, women who abortions. That never gets talked about. If they get talked about, if you've heard those stories, if they've happened to you and you share them with somebody else, it's probably been in whispers and tears. And meanwhile, the people who do this shit are out there unabashed, promoting the, you're talking about Okinawa, there was a big case where the 15-year-old where the was raped by six military men in Okinawa. And one of the things that happened in the aftermath is they replaced the chain of command, somebody got replaced, there was a big international incident, um, and they brought in a new admiral, I, I forget his name, but he literally, he lasted a very short period of time, like three weeks or something, because he came in, he did a press conference, and in the course of it, he said, well, this was really, I've said over and over again, it was really stupid of these soldiers to rape this girl, because for the cost of the money to rent the car to leave the base, they could have bought a girl. That gets said, then they had to like change him, okay? <laughs> because that didn't really go, that was not the right way to handle the PR. But the fact that he said it that way reflects something very widespread and something that people feel is unchallenged and they can just get away with it. Normally they do. And the people who want to speak out against it, look, they have to fight their way through trauma. This is my point. And the other night, then after, people, people came to this protest and then it was through the course of it. Actually, a big fight, you know. I, I told this story years ago. I knew this self defense instructor who um, told me she taught self defense for young women, for women in general. And she said one of the most important things she had to teach women in self defense was to yell and to get angry and to trust their anger when they're under attack. Because women are so taught not to be angry, not to be forceful, not to be. You know, yeah, to be ladylike, to suppress them, to be in whispers and be in tears. That's how women are supposed to be. And the idea that you, she said it's very weird for women to yell. They have to learn how to yell. And I feel like that's, it's, it's a related thing. Women have to learn how to trust them. I see somebody who likes to yell. <laughs> maybe, or maybe somebody who knows what I'm talking about. But women have to learn how to trust their anger when under attack. And to actually feel like, no, this is a moral outrage and we should speak up about it. And similarly, it's not just women, but it's people, it's that feeling of there's a whole male culture and enforcement going on. But this male bonding takes place over the in dehumanization of a, of a woman, you know, who's been reduced to that over the course of decades and in front of thousands of soldiers. That's what she's become and been turned into. And that you have to participate in that. And, and, and the ability to speak against that is suffocating.
and stifling on the defensive. And my point here is that is that two things actually I want to draw out of this, or maybe three. One is that the whole institution and culture and the system that we live in actually has to change. We do need a revolution. We need a different system and a different culture. Um, two, to actually build up and fight for that, you have to challenge things. You can't just, it's not like a build your movement off to the side. It is in opposition and in contestation. I'm not saying every individual in every circumstance it would be safe to, I'm not judging what people do when they're in coercive settings in every absolute situation. But as a movement, as a, as a movement of opposition, you actually have to go in the face of what's wrong. And you have to challenge it out, right? This gets to the point of don't support the troops. I'm not going to make you tell it because you've been telling a lot of your own personal stories. But I know that he, he's told a few times, I've heard him a few times talk about the first time somebody told him that the troops were, were committing genocidal, uh, what is it, um, I forget, racist genocide or something like this. They told you in a bar in Germany. And he got mad. He was like, oh, that's very helpful. I'm glad you pointed that out. You know, that challenged everything about what he had been trying to hold on to and to believe to suppress the things that were gnawing at him about what was wrong with what he was doing. And that's going on like multiple, multiple, like a million times over among all kinds of people. And if that doesn't get directly challenged, then it doesn't, then, then it, you're not doing people any, any good. You're not doing humanity any good, but you're also not doing the individuals who are caught on the horns of that any good. You actually have to tell people the truth. That's the thing. It's, there's not two sides to everything, because some things are true. You don't have to balance them with falsehood. Um, no, it's, I mean, that's what, there's two sides to every issue. No, some things are really fucking wrong, and that's what's true. You know, and, and people need to know that, and they need to deal with that. Wars of genocide and, and domination are wrong. I don't see any need to balance that with, with falsehood. Um, and the more that we're true and honest about this with ourselves and with others and bring that forward as a social force, the more that you can actually anchor and give backing to those who actually, it's, who, who would speak out against that, who would act in opposition to it, who cannot by themselves. It's not just a thing as individuals who can disengage. As a social force, you can be a part of contesting the way the world is and bringing a different world into being. And that is only as a social force, a fighting movement of opposition, can you actually give strength and backing. One, that challenges people who don't think that way yet to start thinking that way, and two, to have the strength and backing to act in, in a different way. But they can't do by themselves up against those institutions. So I just wanna, I wanna, I just want to bring that in, and the other thing, the final point is, is that, because it, it relates, is that you have to fight your way through trauma, and this is just something I think we have to fucking look in the face, and, and it goes with your thing of not crippling ourselves on this. When we had an after meeting about this protest that we held, one of the women who came said, you know, she didn't plan on speaking out, and she got up and she talked about the, the you know, watching ferocious domestic violence that was crippling to family members. She talked about incest. She talked about the role of pornography in her life. She talked about, you know, and all, different people did. They talked about actually the harm, the violence that's been done and that is pervasive in this society against women, uh, which was just one dimension of why we need a different system. But it's a big dimension. And, and, and then she came to our meeting afterwards and she said, wow, I got really scared that maybe I shouldn't get so involved because it's really painful to bring this up. It's really painful to go there. And I think a lot of people go through life and go through this world every day thinking that this is just normal and we should live with this and the only way you can cope and live with this is to stuff to the side half of the shit that is so horrific and traumatic it would make you scream every minute of every day. You know, really. The things that are going on right now as we speak in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in the in the sweatshops of the people who built our smartphones. You know what I mean? These are the, this is the reality. And we're expected to walk around like, you know, we're all living such civilized lives, and then we have some things we do in the movement to improve some things. That's not quite right. <laughs> we actually need to be about, you know, totally changing the whole world. And I think that's going to take a revolution and people should get into that. But wherever you're coming from, and as you learn about that or anything else, there actually has to be a plunging in with, 
you know, as, as radically as the world demands, as, you know, as, as truthful about what the actual world is, the crimes that are going on in our names, and how horrific they are, and, and not being afraid to actually go through the, the trauma of looking at that and confronting it, and actually taking that and bringing it together in a way where we are forging community in opposition, where that actually fuels people's outrage and their determination to fight so that there's a world without all of this horror. And I just think that there's a way that, that you know, mainly I just want to, I want to appreciate that there's, that it's, it's not a, it's not a unfortunate thing that these, that the, that the trauma of it comes up in the course of fighting it. It is an unfortunate thing that there's a world that inflicts such trauma, but it actually is the only way through this. And if we have a movement that doesn't allow for and insist upon people being very honest and going through that and having the support in the community that's honest with them and not saying, oh no, don't bring that up. We want to support the troops. Your point about, your point about, you know, people who aren't proud of what they've done, they need to be able to have a space where that's actually wrestled through with them. And people who've been through other forms of trauma, they need a space to wrestle through that, where it's not blurred. Well, there's some good and there's some bad. No, there's some real crimes people have been complicit with, and there's a way out. If you look at it and you be part of the fight to end that. And that's actually something to feel good about. Not because you try to pretend it wasn't as bad as it was, but because you're honest about it and you're actually honest about being fully in, in making your life as much as possible about putting an end to that. That is a profoundly moral thing. It's a profoundly, it's something that should give people meaning in their lives and it's a basis for the kind of community that's that's both sustained and in line with the world you want to fight for. So I just, I want to, mainly I just want to say that because it's 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 not typical. The kinds of things that that, that have been shared here are not typical and it needs to be more so. And that's part of why, I think. So either if you want to say more or we can open it up. Um. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we should have up. I just wanted to, I just meant to say one thing that I forgot. I wanted to point out, um, you know, I hate to just, like, press people all the time, but uh, there is at least a little reason to, uh, you know, feel a little uh, less um, depressed here recently. Um, there's been a lot of uh, actual, there's been a push within the military community, within the veterans community, to uh, report and actually seek justice concerning military sexual trauma. Um, and it was very interesting, I thought it wrote it down, but I guess I didn't. But, uh, oh yeah, here it is. There is a, uh, there was a group last, I believe, um, like November or December of 28 um, veterans of all the different services who uh, put together a lawsuit. They're trying to sue the Pentagon um, for uh, their role in covering up the rape, the sexual assault, and um, um, you know, uh, and, and not uh, enforcing a, a better a system of protection and things like that. There, there's the group of 28 actually suing the Pentagon, um, and since word of this has gotten out, um, 400 more people have come forward um, and are themselves either trying to become part of the class action lawsuit or found their own class action lawsuit. Um, thus far, uh, you know, our, our system, uh, our legal system is definitely set up to protect those who don't really need protection anyway. But uh, thus far, it's protecting the system, you know, and um, each lawsuit that's been brought about this, they dismiss because of some law, I think it was passed back in the 50s, that said soldiers aren't actually allowed to sue the military. Um, no matter what they do, and they've been upholding that, but it's looking less and less like they're able to, especially when, like I said, 28 service members announced they're going to, to, to launch a lawsuit, and like, loads and loads more people have come forward, and there's even been other groups starting their own, like specifically there's a group now of eight Marines who are specifically trying to sue the Marine Corps. Um, so there is, all of a sudden, you know, it is, uh, it is work that look, that's being done within the system, but for, for whatever reason, the past six months have seen a lot of grassroots activity around this issue specifically and around um, veterans and service members, both men and women, coming forward with this stuff now. Um, and hopefully that's something we're going to continue to see develop. But like I said, the challenge is, is developing that in an honest way and not one that just, you know, 
says, well, we just need to take care of these few bad apples so we can get back to supporting our troops. Um, so that's all I want to say. There has, there's a little grassroots effort, which is, which is uplifting. Um, so if anybody, does anybody have questions? Uh, Bernie, yes, yes, yes. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, what I don't understand, and I understand why the average person has their head in the sand, for whatever reason, they want to support the troops in the home, you know, that kind of thing. But people like you and you know, my friends that are veterans from Vietnam, they come back and they tell the story. Why aren't there more people, like a woman's getting raped in the military, why didn't she come back and tell her sisters and brothers? And, like, I, I don't know, I mean, because it's embarrassing? I mean, and how do we change that? Well, I, def I definitely can't speak uh, to for the sisters. Um, you know, I can speak for the men, uh, you know. Uh, actually, one of the reasons why I started speaking out about the sex um, was right around the time of, like, Winter Soldier, uh, when we had, there was a lot of veterans in this country talk, speaking out about, um, you know, stuff that happened to them, war crimes, or just, you know, negative situations that they were in. Um, I started noticing there was this trend we had all of these, like, you know, hard in combat, that, you know, men and women coming back who would tell them just the worst stories about, you know, like murder and, you know, I mean, the mutilated corpses and, you know, just, I mean, horrible stuff, shooting animals. Um, but I definitely noticed there was a, seemed to be a block there around the sex. Um, you get, like, the hardest looking combat vet talking about, like, you know, I'm pretty sure I killed you know, a pregnant woman trying to get to the hospital, but you asked him what kind of sex he was having, he just like choked up and blushed, you know what I mean? And so, um, it, there is a culture of silence around sex in the military. My personal belief is because military sexual culture is so, and I hesitate to use the word like degenerate, just because of its sort of negative under, historical underpinnings. Um, but boy, uh, you know, sexuality in the military presents itself as um, sick in many ways, completely sick, and does fly in the face of this, uh, this you know, military that, like I said, pastors and preachers feel comfortable asking God to bless on Sunday morning in front of their congregations. Um, you know, the military plays such a significant role in that conservative. Um, you know, perception of the military, but, and also, you know, of like, you know, also not wanting to see society, I guess, you know, obscene up the road. Uh, it's, it's difficult because, like I said, um, it's, this is one of those examples where the facts on the ground fly in the face so wholly of what the public narrative is. And, and that's what I, I think might be one of the reasons um, is, you know, people, know if, if they're honest about their experiences concerning sex. A, they feel embarrassed about it, and B, um, they don't want to look like they don't support the truth. Is there like a certain amount of time a woman come out of war and can't show their anything about what she did? Like, can No. No. Um, I mean, there is sort of the unspoken military code of silence, you know, and of, uh, you know, look, the military has been doing some pretty awful, terrible, horrible things for, since its very inception, like I said, things that I don't even want to just get into, uh, you know, and most people don't, which is, like I said, also contributes to the culture of silence. Um, and, uh, and, you know, part of the way that it does um, sustain itself is through this culture of secrecy. So, like, um, you know, for me, uh, after I, not even, like, when I originally started speaking out, I just started speaking out against the war. I didn't even start speaking out against the military, specifically until quite a bit after I started speaking out about the war. And even when I just started speaking about the war, um, I experienced a lot of blowback 
in, um, from people I knew in the military who didn't like that I was talking bad about the military, or maybe they were worried that I'd tell a story that you know would involve them or something like that. I uh, got an enormous amount of blowback from my family, you know what I mean, especially after um, I started speaking, not just like I said about the war is wrong and illegal, but the military is systematically destroying people's lives. Um, you know, I lost, I lost the paternal side of my family for that position. Um, I'm sh sure your friend has some um, similar situation. Mm. And he was in Iraq. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting thing. I've known a lot of uh, Muslim soldiers, uh, both in the military and out of the military, and it always seems to be a dichotomy that, that forms of either like Muslim soldiers who feel like I can't believe I was duped into doing this. This is a horrible thing. This is a war on Islam. I'm being discriminated against as a Muslim. Or on the other side of it, I've the other half of that dichotomy is like it's like Muslim soldiers who I've met that seem um, to take a bit of pride in being able to uh, you know be part of this institution despite you know whatever. And I've even heard Muslim soldiers refer to themselves as Hajis and be like, "Yeah, I'm a Haji. I'm a fucking Haji. We joke about it all the time. Yo, I'm a Haji. You know, whatever. It's cool. I need a sand digger though, you know, and, or, or something like that. Yeah, I'm just giving an example, but." You know, there does seem to be this this very odd breakdown of like of Muslim soldiers who think it's totally racist and don't want to get out of the military, don't want anything to do with the military, or on the other side, Muslim soldiers who also seem I don't know I don't know, but it almost seems like they feel a little extra special, you know, or that they have a little more authority than everybody else to say the most racist things about Islam. <coughs> you know, they have an Arab last name or something. But uh, it is the, the issue specifically with Muslim soldiers is very interesting. Um, uh, and there's also a lot of grassroots activity going on right now. Um, Muslim soldiers trying to sue the military for discrimination and things like that. Um, I just want to say briefly on this why don't more soldiers speak out negatively, is I think it really is incumbent on people more broadly throughout the culture to say, you know, there has not been a meaningful, significant force fighting against the wars in the streets in a public way and in, in a while. And that actually, if you don't have that going on, there's a lot of people who, they go through it and they stuff it. They don't want to think about it. I mean, that's I, when I hear, I can't speak on it, it's confidential, I hear, I don't want to go there. Yeah. You know, really. And if you had a, if, if not, that. This is another problem, is that, is that everybody thinks that you have to tail after the soldiers. You can't oppose the war unless the soldiers do. No, you have to do what's right and wrong. And you have to do what's right, <laughs> not what's wrong. You have to draw a clear line between right and wrong, and everybody has a responsibility, not just the soldiers. It's a myth. This is one of those myths. Oh, the reason why the Vietnam War ended is because the Vietnam, you know, the soldiers who were in the front line. Well, no, actually, there was a whole lot of different things that happened, including the powerful anti-war movement actually challenged a lot of those soldiers to have to think critically about what they were doing. And the fact that the Vietnamese were fighting a just liberation struggle and fighting it through methods that were actually challenging a lot of the soldiers as to why they were there and doing political education among some of them, that had a big impact too. There was a lot of things that happened and I feel like it's a very good question, why aren't there more speaking out both against the war and, and the atrocities they were part of, as well as why aren't there more women speaking out against the violence against women there. But I feel like the, the question should not be looked at in isolation of the so I don't I'm not saying that you are, I'm just saying for all of us to think about it. If there's not a culture saying these wars are wrong, they must be stopped. If there's not a movement of opposition that is forceful, that's in the streets, that's militant, that's known, that's that's pulsing through society, then you won't even get a lot of those people they won't, they won't go there. It's not what they want to do. It's, it's a lot of trauma they're going to have to surf their way through. You know what I mean? It's not that easy. And a lot of them don't feel good about what they did, but they also are in conflict. And, they, and if they say they don't feel good about it, then what? what? 
what difference would that make? You have to have something where that would make a difference. Now it will make a difference if they do, but it's 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 not just on them. And then just the last thing quickly is on women. This is a culture, this is a society in which if you come forward and say you were raped, it is on you. You get retried. What were you wearing? Why didn't you do something? Why didn't you do this? Da, 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 da. Do you really want to ruin that man's reputation? Why? You know, you get you get taken through it, and the whole culture looks at you as you are the one, and now you're the one who's not only went and got yourself raped, you're also trying to tarnish our troops. I mean, really, if that that's what comes down on you. It comes down hard in the command structure, in the chain of command, and in the broader culture. And if we don't have a movement that's bigger in society that is actually saying no, sexual violence is pervasive and must stop. And and a lot of this, then you're not going to have women feel the backing to come forward in the military or in broader society because one in every four women are sexually assaulted. Most of them don't speak up about it. This is widespread. Um, and then the last thing on this, I, this is the last thing, is that for the men talking about sex is that I have to say that the the mainstreaming of violent and degrading porn exactly. to the degree that most of what people think of as good sex, not you know, a lot, a lot of it, is not that different. It's, it's on a level, it's on a continuum of what goes on in the military. When you're saying it's really sick and twisted, it's on a continuum. I mean, you have a, what is it, at Yale, where the frat boys <coughs> marched on the dorms of, of freshman women chanting, no means yes, and yes means anal. That's what they were chanting. That's that's porn culture. That's rape culture. And it's and if you have that broader culture, you're not going to have men coming out of the military saying, "Wow, that was really vile what we did." They're going to come back out, and it's going to be reinforced. That culture is reinforced. If you go to any porn store in this city, computer, <laughs> you find torture porn. You'll find the same thing that you saw in Abu Ghraib. And I'm and no exaggeration, no difference. And so if that's your broader culture unchallenged, then you're not going to have the challenge coming from the men who went through it in the military because they were in the military. You have to have a challenge. It should include them, but it has to be, those, those terms have to be fought. And that's something that, 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 you know, this movement that I'm part of is seeking to put, on, put in the terrain that's missing right now. Um, so there's, there's other hands. You want to go over there? Oh, hello. Oh, I, yeah, I came late. Um, I just... Oh boy, I have three questions. But first, I just wanted to know your name and what was like your position in the service. Um, Mathis. Uh, Mathis Shiro. Uh, um, I was in the army for five years, and I was a designated as a military public affairs specialist. Um, I wrote, uh, produced, uh, edited, and laid out military propaganda um, on behalf of whatever command. Um. Um, oh well. All right. It would make you first being in the service and then kind of have a slant to turn against. You know, I guess you probably mentioned already, like yeah. the things you're already seeing and while you were there. Um, how were I guess your comrades or the people who, you know in the service? Well, how did they? What were their reactions when you with the banana um, thing that you had attended and? You didn't want to partake in it. Mm -hmm. How did they react to you? Yeah, well, that's that's uh, that's very uh, it's very key. Um, first of all, um, you know, I spoke earlier of, of the situation itself being pretty subversive. Um, you know, while I definitely uh, you know felt uh, comfortable saying no, I'm not going to get on the stage for this. Um, I wasn't very assertive with just how disturbed I was. I, you know, I was my primary concern in that situation was getting back to base without having alienated myself from my uh, fellow soldiers. But they didn't act, uh, react negatively, and that's a very key thing. The vast majority, in fact, uh, um, they saw, or at least at the time, seemed to, to think that this and things like this were a great source of entertainment. Um, and it speaks to, like I said, that sexual culture, that rape culture that was going on in the barracks at the time. Um, you know, it wasn't just the stuff off base. Uh, there was a time even when I was stationed in Japan and Tokyo where 
um, towards the end of my stay there, single male soldiers were no longer allowed to sign women on base after hours because they had such a huge problem with rape and sexual assault in the barracks um, that we weren't even allowed to have guests stay overnight, period, because they had issues with uh, pretty much young Japanese women being like, you know, taken on base by one guy and then having his whole unit set loose on her. Um, they, they had this practice of running trains, um, is what they called it. And, uh, and, and it was very pervasive. And in many cases, like I said, uh, even the female non-commissioned officers were helping to orchestrate these type of things. So um, you're talking about mass culture to the point that even you know, me speaking out about situations like this, the thing like, you know, me talking about like the banana show, for example, or so many other, you know, nude examples of, of, of this stuff that I've shared with over the years, you know, um, given certain circles, um, it, the story invokes very different responses, you know. Here, I, I tell the story and people feel, uh, you know, pretty disgusted, I feel safe to say, by what I'm talking about. But if I told this story, uh, you know, at your average, um, you know, VA um, community uh, or group uh, therapy session, there'd probably be a lot of guys that got a kick out of it, and even would even get off on hearing me talk about that story. Um, and I would say even that those outnumber the bees, um, and uh, and that also makes it very difficult to be a man specifically and talk about these issues. Um, and to talk about them with, with like, you know, guilt and remorse, so. Can we just have oh, sure, one more person? Sure. Is there anybody who hasn't spoken at all yet? Yeah, talking about um, female GIs who've been raped, um, yes. and, you know, I, I wonder whether some of the male GIs are angry that women were led into the military, but also it makes me think of the scandal with the priests, you know, with mm -hmm. covering it all up. And, of course, if a black man in the South had raped a white woman, you know, he'd be like his chair. Right. So I wonder um, if, if a woman has been raped either in the U.S. on base or overseas on base, and she feels the case isn't being prosecuted, does it ever happen that she goes to the local police, the local authorities? Oh, in these overseas communities? Or this, well, either in the U.S. or in Germany and Japan yeah. and gets... Yeah, I can understand. Um, I have never heard of a single case. I spent like I said, all my time overseas. I didn't spend much time in the U.S. Um, but I, I, I do know there are cases where soldiers, I do know many cases where soldiers raped local civilians. And even in those circumstances, they were tried under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, not local law. And typically, at least in the overseas communities, that's part of the Status of Forces Agreement that if soldiers, for example, rape locals, they'll be tried by the military, not local courts. So I, I don't know of any examples. I can definitely speak to this idea, though, there are a lot of men in the military who hate women. Period. In fact, I would call it the dominant culture, is, is a woman-hating culture. Uh, from day one, I went to an all-male basic training. From day one, we were taught that women were uh, inferior, weaker, sex objects, um, waiting for us to go to war so that they could fuck our best friends. Um, wow. You know, I mean, like, crazy, like, really, like, deep, uh, deep, uh, <laughs> that must be the two military. Yeah, well, it's not We used to like them. Yeah, well, in a different kind of uh, liking women. Believe me, they, they, they think they like women. They say, oh, I love women. But, uh, you know, the love of a rapist is different. Exactly. But um, they, there are a lot of men very infuriated and have actually taken the position that um, if women are going to be in our ranks, we need to be like twice as hard on them to either A, drive them out, you know, um, or B, you know, like make them pay or make sure that they're hard enough because if they really think women can be in combat, then, you know, we need to break them off for their own good, you know. So it's like, another, that's another sort of sick aspect of it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of hate sex that happens in the military um, within within the ranks. Um, you know, uh, just uh, you know, there's a, it's it's used as a as a, as a means of domination, um, and so you know everybody can it becomes a victim of it, and even men too. You know, especially gay men. We didn't I didn't even talk about that. Gay men in the military are 
particularly, you know, when it comes to when it comes to light or it's suspected, they can become huge targets for you know male on male rape. Um, and you know, and, and I don't want to say what's more difficult, what's less difficult, but you can definitely see the challenge being a gay man in a military where you're not allowed to be gay, bringing forward a rape charge. You know, if he comes to the hospital. So, um, so there's just a lot of very good questions. So we are on the cusp of needing to conclude. So uh, there's two more hands I see. Maybe people can speak briefly, both of you, and then. We'll and maybe myself make a This thing about uh, not condemning the military as crippling the movement is just so important because if you're not condemning them, I mean, look, it's like saying the Ku Klux Klan isn't a bad organization, but gee, these particular people are really out of control. <laughs> Fuck that. Yeah, right. And if you're not condemning, think about it, if you're not condemning the military, you're not seeing how systemic the strategy of ethnic cleansing and violence is in Afghanistan or wherever. You're not seeing what the overall role that military plays around the world. And look, the reason the rulers have outlawed con condemn, they don't care if you condemn the Iraq war, just don't touch the military because the military is the pillar of their state power. It isn't Congress and, you know, all this other stuff. It's the military. So that's why they want to try. So I just, I thought I really appreciated what you guys have yeah, right said, there. you know, so... Larry's a very smart guy. No. <laughs> Larry's going to worship. Yeah. When's your worship, Larry? It's uh, at noon in, um, it's on, there's one on Iraq at noon in room 602, and then tomorrow at 10 in the morning at the, uh, one of the lecture, lecture hall north, there's a panel on uh, U.S. Move, war moves against uh, Iran. Okay, so people can so, talk to him really quickly. I'm yeah. sorry. Okay, well, I wanted to bring up, and I, I really applaud what you're doing. I love uh, that Mathis actually went out and stuck his fist up and stopped some soldiers that were going to their basic training. And I want to echo what Larry just said because I have a friend who's an activist who has been a couch potato and has, was there when his friend got his legs chopped off blocking the, uh, the arms at the um, Concord Naval Base. And he has said to me, and we've gotten into heated arguments, fuck the military, they're out there killing people, I don't care if they all die. And that's something that I have to rail against because every human being is necessary in the circle of making the change. And when Winter Soldier tried to speak up, they were stifled. They were covered by nobody. They were covered by the BBC and one or two Pacifica stations, and that was it. And I would like to bring something up about the racism that Chinese people who are visible, who are visibly, you know, other, are, are driven to death and suicide by being racially targeted in that way. And in addition to that, I heard the story of a woman who's, um, upper, who's the soldier above her, who was her commander, was regularly raping her, giving her these, these duties, and when she tried to complain about it, she caught a lot of flack, they threatened to take away her pension, and you know, it was just totally humiliating when she came back, she was broken down by it. So I want to say that people are trying to speak up, and they're not given an avenue to speak. And while horrible warmongering is going on, and I'd like to say something about last summer because no, I noticed actually, this. Gonna, we had, I mean, have to come in. I'm sorry, okay. I'm going to have to, the last part of it. Okay, well, the, the last part of it is the warmongering that's going on is being sloughed to the side by false reporting. Yeah. And the stuff that happened in Libya was warmongering. And the stuff that might happen in, in Iran, we're not getting the whole story. So if we don't loosen up the media and give soldiers a voice about what actually happened, we're not going to hear any of it. And we can't, you know, wonder why. Well, they're not letting it come out, you know? Okay, thank you guys for coming. Madness, do you want to say anything? Um, yeah, I, thank you for everybody coming. I really appreciate what you just said. I'm sorry that we had this it's discussion okay. in there. We had a very hard time. Yeah. But about what you were saying about soldiers having a voice, I think it's important. I think a lot of soldiers have even had voices thus far. But what's very important is what those soldiers are saying. I think that all soldiers uh, and veterans, even in the anti-war movement, have some of the biggest... Um, 
you know, we oftentimes do, do the most harm when we present ourselves and our military as our harm because we don't want to alienate ourselves. We need a voice, but we need the right kind of voice. We don't need to just be saying, like, I love the military, I love the military, but it's so sad what happened to me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.